First of all, I uh, just want to say uh, welcome to the School of Forestry and Environmental uh, Studies on this wet afternoon, uh, but more particularly to this uh, panel discussion and the Yale uh, book launch of uh, Corporation 2020, Transforming Business for Tomorrow's uh, World. We're delighted uh, also to have our guests here, uh, Yvonne Schwinard and uh, Vincent Stanley from Patagonia. It's great to have you here, and it's very appropriate that they're here today to join us uh, in this discussion about the intersection of public profits and social purpose and what that means for the future of our uh, economy. Uh, and my job here this afternoon is uh, very simple and very short, and that's uh, because I have the privilege of introducing the author of Corporation 2020, uh, Pavan Sukhdev. Pavan is a good friend uh, of this school. He's the founder and CEO of GIST Advisory, a consulting firm which helps governments and corporations discover, measure, value, and manage their impacts on natural and human capital. Pavan spent uh, much of his early career in the banking sector, and he's advised world leaders on the green uh, economy. And we were hugely fortunate uh, last year uh, to have Pavan join our community as uh, a Dorothy S. McCluskey Visiting Fellow, and he remains with us this year as a Visiting Fellow for the academic year. And he's been a great resource who's reached out to our students and our community, uh, particularly in the area of the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity or team. So uh, we have a treat in store for us for the next uh, uh, hour or so, and uh, uh, we're going to hear more about uh, Corporation 2020. We're going to hear more about uh, Patagonia's uh, philosophy, and it's a huge pleasure to introduce uh, Pavan. Thank you. Thank you. Button the technology of the year that I've been away from. Yes. So th thanks to Seabay, uh, where's uh, Stuart? Somewhere, anyway. Uh, who've been really the organizers for this and also the hosts for our project, the campaign Corporation 2020. And it is a campaign. I'm uh, delighted to have some people here, Thais, Lucia, Mahima, who've been there uh, campaigning, literally, at Rio. So hard that, in fact, they had no time for fun. Isn't that right? So. Um, Without much further ado, I'd like to um, welcome our, our guest here. Yvonne, you are so well known here that I actually need no introduction. Uh, Vincent and Yvonne, your, your, uh, your uh, products, as it were, are no doubt worn by a large number of this community of foresters and environmental people that we have here, and of course by others as well. Um, Patagonia has been called the coolest company on the planet by Fortune. That was a few years back. And uh, you've been always brutally honest about being transparent about the footprints of your products and the impacts of your business with your customers. Uh, a level of uh, integrity, I believe, in communications and advertising and in responsibility towards the commons that, you, uh, that your products help us research and search and enjoy. I think that level of responsibility and integrity is rare to find. Uh, so I commend both of you for, for having achieved that uh, through Patagonia. Yvonne, you founded uh, Patagonia and, uh, of course, are a well-heeled well alpinist and environmentalist of sorts and have also founded a 1% for the planet scheme as part of what uh, Patagonia does to contribute a percent of its uh, annual revenues to environmental causes. I wish uh, many of the clients and companies that I speak with in the Corporation 2020 all did that. That would make life different. Uh, Vincent, as the acting VP of marketing and as co-author of uh, the book that the two of you launched here at Yale in, in the law school, uh, you've been very much part of the, the fabric, if I may make pun, uh, of, of Patagonia. And uh, both of you have actually demonstrated to me, as, as I will describe in a few moments, many of the principles of what uh, my team and I here at Yale called Corporation 2020. 
I um, want to spend a few moments just painting the background. As, um, as Dean Crane mentioned, part of my work for the last several years has been to advise governments on the green economy. The green economy as the way forward towards an economy which achieves human well-being and achieves a wider spread of benefits and reduce disparities between the rich and the poor, but at the same time does not create more environmental risks and even more ecological scarcities. But that kind of green economy uh, is easier said than done. It's been well proven by the UN reports that I was privileged to lead, which were published last year. Uh, it's been well supported by the toolkit for valuing nature services that T brought to the table. But none of this is going to happen because two thirds of today's economy is basically private sector. 60% of GDP generated by the private sector. 70% of jobs are in the private sector. Here in the US, those numbers are more like 75% and 83%. So we're not gonna get anywhere with hand waving and great um, vision in terms of macro direction or e even sectoral direction unless we make change happen on the ground at the corporation level. And that brings me back to the real theme of Corporation 2020, which is that today's corporation is almost hardwired to generate its best performance in a brown economy. How on earth will its, the total of its uh, contributions add up to a green economy? Tomorrow's corporation needs a new DNA. And that DNA is one which recognizes corporations' social purpose, something that has been there in history. After all, corporations were created by kings and queens and governments uh, in order to achieve certain purposes, be it collect taxes or, or uh, create railways or indeed conquer countries like India, which where I came from. Um, corporations did all of that and they did it rather well, but it was with social purpose, howsoever defined. And then came the 19th century and uh, the early 20th, and during that crucible period of 1820 to 1920 was born today's corporation, which is a seeker of profit, an optimizer of value of financial capital for shareholders, but not one that is concerned about this, the living fabric of this planet, that is the natural capital, nor concerned about social capital, which it uses, nor the human capital which it deploys. Of course, there are good exceptions, and Patagonia is one of them. But the, by and large, the DNA that we have been seen encouraged in, in the economy and around the world is the DNA of the large multinational, an arbitrager of resources from where it's cheap to get them, uh, often places in Africa where they are less well governed, an arbitrager of capacity, wherever there is government subsidies to manufacture, such as Singapore, Korea, India, et cetera. An arbitrager of human capital, where it's cheap and available, as in China, India, Vietnam, Cambodia, et cetera. And finally, an arbitrager of sales value, an arbitrager of client markets in Europe, in USA, Japan, and the rich countries around the world. So this form of arbitraging and the, uh, the ability of the corporation today to be what it is, has been developed actually through a legal history which is scarcely uh, 150 years old, and through an economic history which is scarcely 60 years old, post-war, last, uh, lastly has uh, seen the growth of the MNC as the powerhouse of the global economy. In 1970, there were scarcely 20 corporations of turnover greater than $25 billion. Now there are 350. In 1970, there were less than 20 corporations whose turnover was greater than 0.1% of global GDP. Now there are 120. The bulking up of the corporation and the MNC as a success model of today's economy is despite the fact that we see degradations in every other sphere. Employment is under stress. Economic growth is under stress. Poverty has not disappeared. The environment is severely stressed. All aspects of our existence appear to be stressed except the success of the corporation. I call this divergence. Such divergences cannot carry on forever. And the challenge here is how do we engender the DNA of Corporation 2020, our responsible corporation whose goals are aligned with society, who works out its externalities, measures them, manages them, creates human capital, builds communities and creates social capital. How do we get all this to happen in good time so that we don't actually you know, drive the super tanker into the, into the storm that we are headed towards? So with this quick background as to what Corporation 2020 is about, um, I just want to launch into some dialogue with, with the two of you and uh, ask you some questions which I hope will, uh, uh, will inform the audience and uh, which I hope will give us, uh, us and myself and my team uh, also grist for the mill, as it were. I'd like to say that some of my team are here, not all of them, who've helped, and Yale has been truly the, the uh, home of 
the project Corporation 2020 and continues to be. Uh, Yale Forestry and the School of Management um, have been the providers of remarkable talent, Yvonne and uh, Vincent, who have written complete chapters in this book. And of course, all chapters written with passion tend to get edited by people like me because you know I might have slightly different styles and views and so on. But by and large, this is the work of a team. And uh, that's what you see in Corporation 2020. Patagonia has been uh, a leader in creating and, and building this DNA. And uh, among the things that you've uh, been involved in is creating an understanding of externalities. Yvonne I, and Vincent, I still remember this lovely sentence in your book, which I have quoted now very often, which is it, the simplest statement of the problem of externalities, which is that everything manufactured, you say, everything manufactured is sold at a price which is lower than its cost. And that's a way of saying that, of course, the externalities of the business are not accounted for, and the prices of the resources that go in are not properly priced. Resource taxation doesn't exist, which is a theme in our book, and externalities are a theme in our book. Um, do you see the, the word externalities and the idea of being cognizant of externalities becoming something that will come, become real as a result of things like your Outdoor Industry Association and the Sustainable Apparel Coalition? Do you see this as a direction that's moving in the right way? Well, <clears throat> I think it'll be forced by the consumer. Mm. You know, you'll affect change in corporations either through government regulation mm. or through the market. Yeah. And by far, the, you know, the, the strongest force is market force. Once consumers start voting with their, wall, uh, with their wallets, and once we can educate consumers so that you walk into a department store and there's five brands of jeans, and, and each one has a grade according to how responsibly they were made, and one is a two and one is a 10, mm. I really believe that the consumer will make intelligent choices based on the health of the planet, mm and choose the genes that have caused the least amount of damage. Um, you know, most of the damage caused to the environment is caused unintentionally, yeah. just through ignorance. We have no idea. You know, I've heard that it takes seven barrels of petroleum to produce one cow. <laughs> well, you know, once, once you start thinking about that, you say, oh my God, we're supporting, by eating meat, we're supporting the petroleum industry. Um, so when it comes to consumer goods, I think we have a chance by changing, by making it, you know, what we're trying to do at Patagonia is making it very uncool to consume and discard endlessly. Um, you know, a guy built a 25,000 square foot home in Jackson Hole, and he was driven out of Jackson Hole because his neighbors made so much fun of him <laughs> that he... He left. He didn't feel welcome. That's what we have to do. And, uh, and that'll, I mean, corporations only make what we want, what we tell them to make. Um, you know, we're not going to affect petroleum companies because we're addicts. You're not going to tell your pusher that you're not going to buy drugs from them anymore. <laughs> so that's a different story. But when it comes to making clothing or any kind of consumer goods, we can have a huge effect by how we vote. So I think it's a matter of uh, the sustainability index bringing awareness of how much really goes into products. I mean, I, I, I talked about, I think I, I'm so, I hate to be repeating myself, but I've talked to so many groups here, so I don't know who I, what I said to who. <laughs> don't, but. don't worry, it's fine. You can say it one more time. <laughs> This you is know, a we, group. we were talking about, we've calculated yeah. how many liters of water or gallons yeah. of water goes into making a t-shirt. Do you remember what that, I mean, it's huge. Yeah. It, it's an enormous amount of water. But you can't stop at that. You have to calculate, well, what kind of water? It's not just water. I mean, you know, there's a big difference between bottled water, right, and tap water. Well, there's a big difference between growing cotton in an area where it rains or an area that's in a desert and you're 
depleting an aquifer that's mm. where the water is millions of years old and is not being replenished, like the RLC or something, which is drying up because of cotton farming, mm. or they've had to put in a dam, a reservoir, which caused all the damage and displaced people and all of that just mm. to be growing cotton. So once ourselves at Patagonia understand that it's not just water anymore, it's, it makes a big difference where we grow our cotton. Mm. Now we can choose to grow it in a, in a place that uh, rains. Yeah. yeah. But until we know that, um, we're just as stupid as everybody else. Yeah. We're, just, uh, we're just blindly going along in business without looking at the externalities. Yeah. You've given us a number of uh, ideas which I'd just like to push a little further, Yvonne and Winston. Yeah, sorry, you want to comment? To, just to su yeah. suggest that they, can you hear me? With the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, <laughs> one of the things that all of these companies face um, cost pressures and uh, they face the risk of uh, consumer abandonment if they're, they're all afraid of bad press, not bad press anymore, but a bad notice through the internet. So companies are very defensive. Mm. But one of the things the Sustainable Apparel Coalition does is it allows people to, it allows companies to establish industry-wide standards that are pre-competitive. So a company that might be afraid to do something good because they're, the other company won't do it and they'll be able to undercut them on price doesn't come into play. You're essentially uh, doing a form of industry regulation that levels the playing field. So that's, that's really important in working with um, corporations toward, uh, toward change. Yvonne and Vincent, let me just uh, pick, you raised a number of points. Let me just pick a few of them, three or four, and uh, use that to take our, our discussion forward. You brought in the issue of consumers, and I agree with you. Finally, there's no force greater than the consumer that could change. But today's consumer is bombarded with today's advertising. And today's MNC is funding the advertising that creates the demand, where basically you're preying on human insecurities, converting them into wants, converting the wants into needs, needs into demand, demand into production. There's a cycle which has been going on for some time. Your ad was remarkable because it just went boom. This was the one I, I saw in November last year. It said, don't buy this jacket. And that was on, on the day when everyone flocks to stores to buy, saying, because here's its footprint, you should try and use it, and if not, surrender it in and replace it. So that's one kind of advertising, and then there's everything else. Don't we need to change that to sort of get the consumer to actually be able to respond to well, his or her conscience? You know, the millennium generation doesn't believe in advertising. Ah. It's not working for them. Um, they see through it. They see that it's all lies. and. <laughs> And they, they don't watch television. I mean, the intelligent ones are not watching television. And they're communicating am among themselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, social media can destroy a company overnight. Yeah. Word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And this is the new advertising. I mean, look at magazines. Uh, <laughs> I get these fly fishing magazines. It used to be this thick. Mm. Now they're this thick. Yeah. <laughs> There's no more advertising. Yeah. And uh, times have changed. And I think social media is such a powerful force. You know, I talked about uh, civil democracy, strongest force in the world. I mean, it creates governments, it takes down governments. Any gains we're making as a society are being done through civil democracy. There's nothing happening in government. And uh, that's a powerful force. Yeah. And I think that's, that's my only hope is that, uh, that does happen. That does happen. Yeah. Yvonne, one person who would definitely agree with you on the social media is Jürgen Zeitz, uh, the exec chairman of Puma. He's also very interested, like yourselves, in moving forward towards disclosing externalities. Would he and his company and others be part of the coalition? They, he, they are part of the coalition. Right. Yeah, we have, we have almost 50 companies which represent uh, about 35% of the entire apparel and footwear sales in the world Excellent. represented. And it's like, you know, they're doing it because they don't want to see watered standards. Mm. Mm. 
you know, you see organic standards for food and government, you know, fueled by pressure from corporations is always trying to dumb down those mm -hmm. standards. I'm really convinced that these 50 companies are doing this because they don't want to see water standards. And in fact, most of them have nothing to lose. It, it's still going to be a level playing field for them. You'd say, take Target, for instance. They sell products from lots of other manufacturers. And, you know, by cleaning up the whole supply chain of all of these different manufacturers, it's going to be a level playing field for them. They don't care. It's not going to cost them any money. Uh, but it's really driving change down all through the supply chain. I mean, when we announced the sustainability index in China, we invited uh, 250 big manufacturers in the clothing business. And thousands wanted to come. Mm -hmm. And those 250 went away saying, I'm going to get ahead of this curve. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start doing it right now. I'm going to clean up my act because this is coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a powerful force. That's very good news, and, and it also suggests that typically there is a lot of competition and, and a sense of uh, me first. And sometimes leaders like Puma may lead in a direction, leaders like Patagonia may lead in that direction, but others will not follow because they got there first. They've taken the space, so to speak. Do you sense a bit of that, or have the leaders well, in business become more mature? I mean, look, look what happened in the automobile industry in America by dragging their feet, waiting for the customer to tell them what to do, mm. they, they almost lost, went they bankrupt. <laughs> That's right. yeah. yeah, they had to be forced by the government to change. Yeah. And guess what? They're starting to thrive now. So the companies that are going to be dragging their feet are going to go out of business. Because it's a different world now. Vincent, do you see uh, others following the example of the Apparels Coalition, the Sustainable Apparels Coalition, in terms of getting together and creating product standards and company-wide standards for disclosure? Yeah, I, I don't know a lot about how uh, robust or how serious the activity is, but I know there are over 400 different indexes being, industry indexes being yeah. developed. Every, every company, every issue that we see in our personal life or everything that we care about as human beings, eventually, comes across the corporate table because these these corporations, which are structured very badly, uh, and to cr and, and and almost have to create harm, are also run by human beings who run into these questions in their own lives, and they face actual corporate pressures. Mm -hmm. That they, in terms of the cost of everything, we were just talking about the cost to heat a home in Connecticut of, you know, for for a large house of of $4,000 a, a month or something like that with, yeah, yeah. with fuel oil and 2000 a month with natural gas. Well, this is extraordinary. And you can imagine what kinds of pressures this creates for, for companies who are, uh, uh, have to operate on a much larger scale than the personal home. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. But that's yeah, it, it gives us an idea. And specifically, uh, let me explore two avenues. You brought up the issue of cotton. As coalitions such as these evolve standards and hopefully consistent standards, would that create, in your opinion, more pressure to grow the right cotton, uh, sorry, to grow cotton in the right way, to use water in the more responsible way? I mean, you, you, you had a, quite a challenge convincing cotton growers to give you organic cotton at the time when you decided to change. You had to go down to the village level and to the farm level, yeah. communicate what you needed. Hopefully, will this change or is this still a challenge to get resources? Uh, no, together. it's not a challenge anymore. I mean, uh, you know, when we decided to switch over to organically grown cotton, there was no help out there from anyone. Yeah. There were no books about uh, how to make clothing more responsible. Mm. There was no books about whether dyes are toxic or not. Mm. There was no information whatsoever. There were hardly anyone growing cotton organically because a few companies like VF Corporation and Esprit had tried it, but they tried it with an attitude that, well, we'll try this, and if it doesn't work, we can yeah, always go yeah, back. And yeah, sure yeah. enough, it didn't work, and they went back. Mm -hmm. Well, we said, we're, we're going to not make clothes if we have to use uh, industrially grown cotton because it's evil. Mm -hmm. And that made a real commitment. But we had to invent all of this stuff. We had to 
We had to co-sign loans for the farmer who couldn't get a, a loan from the bank because the banks are in business with the chemical companies. And, and then, uh, you know, okay, so then we finally figure out some partnerships with a few suppliers. We, the, the, uh, the spinning mills wouldn't spin our cotton into yarn because it was sticky. <laughs> it's like bad dope, you know, it was full of seeds and stems and, <laughs> and uh, sticky aphids. You know, the sticky stuff yeah, from aphids. Yeah, and yeah. so no one would spin our cotton. So then we found one spinner in Thailand who froze it uh -huh. and uh, froze the, the cotton. And then it ran through the machines. More and easily. so okay. <laughs> he did it because he saw that this was the future. Right, right. And we worked with a few partners. And now you can buy organic cotton uh, all over the place. All, yeah. Many countries are growing it. Uh, a lot of spinners that are, will spin it for you. The cotton gins will gin it for you. And so we created this, and it's all people who believe that this is the, the, right, way the right way forward. Yeah. 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 And it, it can be both people who believe that morally and also people who see a business opportunity, uh -huh. yeah. which our, our spinner in Thailand did, did it for both reasons. Um, we also worked 20 years ago to, we, uh, a supplier literally created a new kind of recycled catalog paper capable of printing high quality photographs for us, knowing that he would never make the money back from us, but he could sell it as a, a, a create a new product in the industry, and, and that's, he did, and was very successful. So that's we, another- We were the first ones to do a catalog on a recycled paper, and now, you pick up a yeah. surfing magazine and it's recycled paper. It, yeah. it started from us. We were the first ones that, to ask, ask paper companies yeah. to do this. Yeah. Yeah. So. Sometimes a little leadership can go a long way. Can go long. And sometimes it can leave you lonely. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, that's smarter though. When you get so far ahead of the pack, <laughs> they shoot you in the back. That's right. <laughs> there is that risk as well. Actually, I was uh, recently in China with the, uh, the head of Hymen, solar water heater makers, the, la the world's largest. What's the name? Hymen. Oh, that doesn't sound very it, good to me. It, yeah, that's right. Uh, it, Bad it, brand it, name. Not, now he thinks it doesn't sound good to him either. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> It's actually, his name is Wang Ming, so this was kind of the anglicization of Wang Ming, so it's become Hai Ming. Uh, but anyway, he's, he, this thing about the daggers, he was telling me that, I was asking him, what is your biggest threat? He says, my competition wants to kill me. I said, excuse me? Actually said, my competition wants to kill me. They are talking to the government with negative stories. Yeah. They are trying to eat into my, my market. They are trying to change the laws, which will destroy my business. <laughs> so it is, it is true that uh, leaders don't necessarily not only not have followers, but sometimes they have serious opponents. But <laughs> I, for one, am delighted that, that you stuck with it. Um, I want to now uh, ask a little more about uh, this whole issue of accounting. Because whilst measuring externalities, understanding them is all part of responsible business behavior, and you've shown leadership there, you need to engage society a bit more so that these ideas push down into business practice more widely. We have great leaders, such as yourself. We don't have enough followers. And that is the challenge of sustainability at an economic le at a, a worldwide economy level. So how do we get more followers? And I think that's what leads to, let's see yeah. what systems can be introduced, which are in any case being followed by the leaders, but which would be good for followers to follow. Uh, a question for you. I mean, in your book, uh, you both say, accounting as practice still assumes that the benefits of nature and the commons are free and that spoiling them has no cost. So how, could you give us some thoughts, both of you, on what you would like to see change in the nature of accounting such that the value of nature, such that the benefits which business enjoys are reflected and the damages are not caused in the way they are? If you want to answer that, yeah. let, let, me, let me say one thing. Please. Sure. Well, for, first of all, Um, we don't see as our competition, uh, when we make an organic t-shirt, we don't see that our competition is beefy teas. Mm. 
because it's a completely different product. We see our competition as other companies making organic, organic cotton t-shirts. Right, right. And the more competition that we have in, in making organic t-shirts, the happier we are. Yeah, yeah. So we're sharing because it, it means that the price goes down because, you know, uh, because of quantity. And so we share all this information with other companies, with competitors. We started an organic cotton exchange that, that uh, if you're a company that wants to do clothing out of organic cotton, you go to them and they give you all the sources and suppliers. And you can go online at Patagonia Footprint Chronicles and it'll tell you where we make all our stuff. It'll give you the names of the factories. Why? Do we do that? Because we want them to thrive. Right. right. With, uh, and when we ask them to have a better labor practice or, you know, you should have a child care center in, in this uh, factory, they'll do it. Because they want our business and they, see, they know that it brings in other business. But anyway, I, you can talk about the rest of it. I, I th I think it, it would be difficult for us as a, as a company to develop uh, ac accounting practices mm -hmm. that could then be used by other companies. We don't have uh, that kind of expertise. And so, but we'll, what we tend to do when we're in that situation is to work with partners or to learn from other people. Sure. So uh, we mentioned in the book there's a partnership now between Dow Chemical and uh, the Nature Conservancy and Price Waterhouse Coopers yeah. to uh, really measure all of the external costs for every product Dow Chemical makes. So that's a very serious ambition. If that were Organic worked, napalm. <laughs> organic <laughs> napalm. <laughs> um, I, that's a, if, if, some com if some larger companies do that and if some uh, associations, mm. uh, if, the, if the big accounting firms start to develop that methodology, mm. then I think that's something we can adopt and it's also something that we can help push within our industry. Well, I'm going to pick you up on that one because we are actually doing that. There's yeah. a co another coalition that's been formed consisting of the World Business Council of the Integr International Integrated Reporting Committee, GRI, yeah. and so right. on. Basically, the, and supported by the TEEB group. So a lot of uh, ecological and environmental economists and right. technical engineers involved in actually estimating these externalities on a sector by sector basis. Right. And uh, I hope to be following up very soon afterwards with you, at least for the apparel side, because we want one of our, one of our projects is on cement. Uh, uh -huh. Another is, as in the US, with S uh, SASP is on health industry, and the other should be on hopefully apparel. Right. So with, with that kind of, uh, uh, if you like, external support. And uh, of course, this includes the accountancy firm as well. So with that kind of external support, do you feel comfortable moving forward in this direction? And, and, yeah, we, and I'm, I'm, I don't, <laughs> I'm not the CFO, but uh, <laughs> so I, I shouldn't speak for her. But I, I think that that's, um, that's exactly the kind of thing we would tend to take up. But we've mentioned that we, we pay 1% for the, uh, for the planet, we give 1% of our sales rather than a percentage of profits yeah. to environmental causes, and we tax ourselves. But we really don't know um, the environmental costs uh, financially of, of, the, of the clothing we produce. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we would eagerly welcome that. I, we also had a, we were talking over at, at lunch about uh, kind of the role of the, of the, of the the intersection between the university and the corporation in a new mm -hmm. way. And I think one of the things we've experienced, we, our company grew out of a very small culture of climbers and surfers that we hired friends of friends. And we were able to keep this fairly horizontal, fairly passionate, uh, environmentally oriented uh, culture of people who love nature. We got it to survive from two sales of 200,000 a year to 600 a mil million a year, 40 years later. But we've also grafted on a professional culture, and not just one professional culture, but several. Because the people who do work in, our, in, in finance and do have MBAs, mm -hmm. the people who work in our production come from you know, the University of North Carolina textile department. 
people from marketing have marketing degrees, and then they've come to us through various company cultures. None of them have ever had any kind of education in sustainable practices mm -hmm. or in valuing externalities. Mm -hmm. So they come into the company with this kind of training, mm -hmm. and we have to kind of graft the Patagonia experience. It would be a <coughs> tremendous benefit mm -hmm. to any company that was trying to do something to have the kinds of questions that are raised in this school as part of the professional background of almost everybody who would come in yeah. to work in a corporation. No, I completely agree. And I think that's, uh, that's something certainly that I'm personally committed to, together with the people from this TEAB extern Business Externalities Coalition. Uh, my final question to both of you is uh, really where next? Uh, you know, you, uh, Patagonia clearly has the social purpose behind it. You recognized early, as, as you've said, uh, the needs of the planet and the needs of society and built that into your business model. That's actually the number one principle that we have in Corporation 2020. You just mentioned, uh, Vincent, the talk of, and your, your use of the word culture is exactly the words that you use as well. The creation of culture, the adoption of culture, and turning that into community, and that mm -hmm. itself generating that uh, collection of forces between people that make things work. Today, the village community and the neighborhood are dying away, but corporations have the opportunity because of who they are and how powerful an institution they are to create alternative good communities, and you are clearly doing that. You teach people you come in and create knowledge in them, increase their capacity to earn, you create human capital, the institute aspect of the, of the, of the corporation. Again, you, you hit that bang on, and finally, and to me most importantly, understanding externalities, understanding that the space in which the corporation operates today is not just the space of physical and financial capital for shareholders, but rather the space of physical, financial, human, social, and especially natural capital for stakeholders widely, and responding to that understanding, behaving as if you are truly optimizing value rather than just optimizing shareholder profits. I think Patagonia ticks all those boxes. So in that sense, the way we define it, you would be a Corporation 2020. My challenge and my question is, where next? How do we get more companies to be like you? What are the key levers that you would pull? What are the key things that you would do? Well, I mean, I'm not an educator. I only know what I can do with my own company. And I've always believed that there's only one form of leadership, and that's by example. So what we're trying to do is minimize the damage that we do as a company and uh, educate our customers, mm -hmm. lead by example, hopefully, and by doing that, have other companies uh, see that this is a profitable business model. Mm -hmm. and in fact, every time I have a business problem, the answer is always increase the quality. Mm. And I see that as, as the way out of this consuming, discarding, endlessly society yeah. is to buy fewer products, but very much higher quality products that are multifunctional, that will last a long time, and, uh, and something that you can prize and give to your children. And uh, I mean, that's the kind of society we have to get to. We have to get away from this consume, discard. Because, you know, we have limits. Mm, yeah. the economists won't admit it, but there are limits to everything that humans do. <laughs> yeah, there are planetary boundaries. I think we Absolutely, and we're, we've gone beyond those limits. In mm. fact, we're killing ourselves. We're destroying the planet that is the source of everything we need and depend on. And uh, so, um, but when I look at my company, I mean, back, back to mm. being on the cover of Fortune magazine, mm. <laughs> and it said the coolest company on the planet. My Italian friend, who has a wry sense of humor, wrote, wrote to me and said, ah, I see you're on the cover of Fortune. I said, I see that the mouse got the advertising cat magazine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think
think we are influencing okay. uh, so, so other exactly. companies, and that's why we stay in business. I mean, I have no desire to become wealthier, and I don't have any desire to see Patagonia get to be a billion dollar company. It may become a billion dollar company. In fact, it's, if we have more recession, it probably will because we just thrive in recessions. Yes. <laughs> because, yeah, consumers become conservative. They stop being silly. They stop buying fashion. They buy practical products, and that's what we make. And they throw away less. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, but uh, I, I constantly, you know, being a climber and a kayaker and uh, doing a lot of different risk sports in my life, I know that there, you never exceed your resources. And you live within your means. Otherwise, you're dead. And so I'm constantly trying to think about what size Patagonia should be. Not that we want to stop at that size, but we want to keep strictly with natural growth. Not growth that's fueled by more advertising and more promotion and more building more stores or anything, but growth that's fueled by natural demand for our product. Right. right. And I don't know what that is, but we have no desire to exceed that. And I think, um, you know, we're all amateurs at, in Patagonia. I mean, there's very few people with a business degree. Um, I have a degree in. John Burroughs High School, an auto mechanic. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think we need to diversify the company. Yeah. And I'm interested in the food business because I, I, I'm such a pessimist that yeah. I think yeah. one world event could bring the whole world economy down because it's global now. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, nature hates gigantism. Mm, it hates mm, globalism. Mm. It wants to constantly make new species and, mm. and it loves small, diverse mm, things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the more global you are, the more at risk you are as a business. Right. And I want to diversify the company and I'm very interested in food because the revolution that we hopefully started with clothing, That's I want to do with food. Fantastic. Because we're not going to need clothing in, a, in tough times. We're going to need to eat. And we're going to eat, need to eat in a different way than we're eating now. Yvonne and Vincent, that's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> With that sobering and exciting, sobering because it's about coming back to basics food exciting because it suddenly gives me an idea of what to call you here next for, which is the food industry. <laughs> <laughs> so bring in exciting thoughts. I'd like to give the floor across to, uh, to the audience, but first uh, I'd like a special mention and welcome to Alan White. Alan, thank you for being an inspiration and thank you for inventing the original Corporation 2020, which was 20 slash 20 the vision. Uh, a very thoughtful project and uh, initiative about corporate redesign, whose thread, threads and strings we picked up and tried to see what can we do quickly, as in by the year 2020, when we believe that we are hitting planetary boundaries, to a point where I think if we haven't changed economic direction and resource use, then that's curtains. And that's the reason why our oh, you're, you're a doom bat too. Was terrible, terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we, we can compete on that, that's right. But uh, I just want to first uh, stir the conversation with the audience, Alan, by requesting you to just give a few comments on do you think we are on the right track from where you began uh, more than a decade ago, a uh, couple of decades ago actually, if you think about it, and are we on the right track and what do you make of Patagonia as, uh, as an example of Corporation 2020? Uh, the second one's easy. <laughs> You're my hero. Yes, excellent. <laughs> 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 We have uh, indeed, uh, without thinking about uh, big intellectual ideas and uh, long visions and uh, necessarily, but just by way of example, leadership by example is uh, all about, is what pa Patagonia is about. So the inspiration, even uh, the, the mainstream and with your face on Fortune magazine, I mean, that's, 
<laughs> that's the ultimate intrusion, I would say, uh, into the uh, world of, uh, of business, and particularly large business. So uh, I, I congratulate you, and, I, and onward. I'll, I'll buy your food as well, <laughs> along with Pavan. Uh, and I uh, say to Pavan that uh, we, uh, as, uh, we coined the term uh, Corporation 2020 some eight years ago with a focus on what we call corporate purpose, corporate design, uh, corporate ownership structures, and corporate governance. Those are our themes. And we were, from that time, painting pictures of the, f since that time, been painting pictures of future forms of a corporation, yeah. imagining what they would look like in 2020 and beyond, 2030 even, and trying to imagine uh, not just the models of the future, but pathways toward them. Happily, and fortunately, and uh, delightfully, uh, Pavan uh, picked up the threads for actions through uh, accountable advertising, through resource taxation, through externalities, disclosure, and I'm sorry, I'm missing one. Leverage. Yeah, yeah, controlling leverage in business, not just financial corporations, but corporations generally, which is a huge problem, of course, creating the kind of brittleness and potentially catastrophic uh, consequences that uh, you've referred to in this panel. So the complementarity of our building the vision are thinking about these structures and models for the future, inspired by the real world. People like Patagonia, people in other, uh, Natura in Brazil, they're, they're, there's small numbers of companies that uh, are not waiting for the vision. They are the vision, in a way. Uh, Novo Nordisk in Denmark, another sterling example of a really uh, creative thinking pharmaceutical company. Uh, John Lewis Partnership in the UK. Uh, th these are companies, Nike, the poster child of uh, poor practices now come along and uh, very much <laughs> starting to look and feel like Patagonia in a, in a, in a way in terms of disclosure and sustainability uh, modeling for its products and indexing and so on and so forth. So th there's, uh, there's numbers of these companies. The problem is the numbers are about two, two to three dozen right, in, my, in, my, in our estimates. So companies are the go-to companies. Those are the inspirations. Those are the models that need to be scaled up by thousands. Uh, after all, there's 80, 100,000 multinationals in the world and untold millions of other enterprises. So it's a huge universe which is basically detached from, disjoined from all the concepts, the ideas that Pavan has been developing, that we've been developing in our own modeling of corporate forms. And uh, the, it's, 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 a slow, it's a painfully slow journey, but it's one that we have to pursue if we don't pursue it, we're imperiling our, our future, clearly already imperiling our future and future of our grandchildren, and that's simply not an option. So uh, we have to get all these wonderful ideas mainstreamed, and we have to do it quickly. Thanks, Alan. Questions from the audience? Um, gentleman in the middle here. Yeah. And Kiss hold, please. Yep. Use it. And then after that, the lady at the back there. Yeah. A quick question. You're uh, hey, moving. Your name, please. Oh, my name is, is Dylan Walsh. I'm a graduate of the forestry school. And you're moving into the food sector sort of implies to me that you don't see companies in the food sector doing what you would like to see done, sort of stepping out in the way you did in the apparel industry three or four decades ago. And I was wondering if that's the case and if it's not the case if you do see companies in other sectors that in maybe 10 or 15 years might be the sort of next generation Patagonia of their sector? Well, I'm looking at it more as an entrepreneur. You know, I see that we develop a lot of very loyal customers who really see the added value of all the things that we're doing to be, to cause less harm and they're supporting us. And um, I see that there's a lot of confusion in food. You can go to a fish market and there's organic Irish salmon. <laughs> what does that mean? It means, in reality, it means it's farmed just like every other farm salmon in uh, net pens out in the ocean and there's, you know, there's this much jelly sea lice underneath the, the pen, and then down below the pen is on the, in the ground is six, seven feet of fecal matter and uh, where there's nothing alive, 
wherever the, they put a fish farm in an estuary, it kills all the lobster fishing. I mean, it, it's horrible. But you go to a fish market, it's called organic Irish salmon. Oh, sounds good. I think I'll buy that. <laughs> you know, uh, most of the so-called energy bars that you see are candy bars. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, there's no cane sugar, there's no high fructose corn syrup, but there's sugar made from um, rice. rice. Yeah. You know, they're candy bars. I can't eat them because I don't like heavy sweet foods like that. So there's a lot of confusion. Uh, yeah, there are, you go to a health food store and there's a bazillion products in there, all touting to be good for you. What does that mean? Are they really good for you? I mean, look how many people have uh, allergies to gluten. Mm. The one out of three people born in America is gonna have diabetes. Uh, we're eating wrong, and yet there's health food stores all over the place. Mm. So I want to, I, I want to, you know, have a clear message. I want to, every product that we do is going to be well thought out, as sustainable and made as responsibly as possible, so that the Patagonia customer who just buys a Patagonia Provisions product without having to read this monstrous Rains, label yeah. to mm. see if there's anything toxic in there or not. Mm, right. So I look at it as an entrepreneur, just like I looked at clothing. I mean, we didn't start out to make responsible clothing. We couldn't make any money hammering out pitons in my blacksmith shop. So I saw it as an <laughs> opportunity to make money. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that answer. Uh, Lady in, yeah, back. Yeah. Hi, um, Anastasia O'Rourke. I'm also a graduate of this school and an entrepreneur, and I'm working on exactly on this problem of proliferation of labels and standards and so on. So my question to you is, how do you actually decide as a company which type of standard you get involved in? So I see that you have Blue Sign and you're involved in the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which is a sort of quasi-standard, but there are many more out there. So which ones do you actually put resources into, given that you're a leader and probably many cases ahead of what the standards are gonna be, end up being set at? Thanks. Yeah. We look at who we think is the most serious and also um, the most uh, practical and results oriented. So we, we like the blue sign people a lot. We help get them, we also help get them started at the Swiss, Swiss firm. They evaluate the processes as well as the chemical elements of every uh, uh, dye and finish uh, used in fabric. We couldn't do this on, on our own. We couldn't develop that expertise on our own. So we, I'm not even, there are, there are I wasn't part of the process that chose Blue Sign over others, mm -hmm. but I know we helped kind of nudge them along the way that we thought was the best. We work with Fair Labor Association to uh, do uh, social audits or audits in factories. Um, they were started by a fellow who was South African, who was involved in the anti-apartheid movement and then got involved uh, in the anti-child labor movement. They work with a number of, uh, of, of companies. They work proactively rather than giving a, a, a company a report card. They help companies establish mediation procedures for problems um, so, it, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but we, you generally have two or three, four institutions or groups to choose from, and we choose the ones we think are the most serious and also practical and also sometimes fast-moving, because some of the, some of the uh, organizations that come out of academic work can be very, very slow. Uh, lady in the front and the gentleman in green jacket at the back. Hi, um, I'm Melissa Spear, also a graduate of the School of Forestry. And um, I run an organization here in New Haven, which is um, focused on working with urban youth and developing ecological literacy in urban youth. Um, and, and one of the key points, well, there are two points to develop the next generation of environmental leaders, but also to get them to understand what the impact of their consumer choices are. And I, I feel that um, urban youth in particular from, and 
many from low-income neighborhoods are a really key part of the consumer base. And I'm wondering if your company has thought about what role they play in your constituency and how you reach out to them because I certainly think it's critical to this movement that they um, embrace uh, the same principles that, that we do. Well, we can't do it all. So we're focused on seeing that there's a habitable planet for those young people. That's about, I mean, you know, we give uh, five, five and a half million dollars away last year. We gave to 600, 700 different environmental organizations. Hmm. We can't give to every single one that hits us up. So we've limited ourselves strictly to activist environmental organizations. And we don't give to the big ones um, because, you know, Nature Conservancy gets its money from conservatives. <laughs> so we give money to the little <laughs> grassroots organizations that no one else will fund. Excellent. And so as far as the social aspect, the food uh, will have a social aspect in each case. Um, you know, like I, I've been interested in grains, and one of the grains I was really interested in is barley, and because I've done a lot of climbing in the Himalayas and Tibet and places, and I've talked to Sherpas who say, yeah, we'll eat your freeze-dried food down low, but up high we need to eat our barley mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. buttered tea, because mm -hmm. that gives us energy. Well, why does this roasted barley give more energy than our freeze-dried dinners? I want to know the answer to that. And uh, so maybe we come out with a sampa, a barley sampa, <laughs> that you can use for backpacking, you can use in your house. And there's a story of, of why it's the key ingredient in Tibetan foods. And uh, like right now, I'm, uh, I'm looking to do a bison jerky. Where we're going to be bu buying the bison. Locally in, in, in Tibet? From, in, in no, no. Okay. From, uh, <laughs> from South Dakota. And, uh -huh. and we're trying to convince the Lakota Sioux to get rid of their cows and switch the bison. And we'll buy their bison if they do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, each food will have a social aspect to it. Mm -hmm. but. But anyway, we can't do it all. We're just trying to save this planet because, like David Brower says, there's no business to be done on a dead planet. Dead planet. Yes, right. yeah. It's very, very well put. And the last question, and after that, I'll request Dean Crane to come back in here and retrieve these books. So your last question, sure. sir. Um, my name is Rafi Vilner. I'm a student in Yale, freshman in Yale College. And you talked about this a, a lot yesterday in, uh, at the law school, a little bit today. And it seems that one of the, the way, uh, one of the main reasons that Patagonia has been able to be so successful in um, promoting social entrepreneurship and pr promoting companies that actually do good and are successful companies is because uh, obviously Patagonia has been a, a very successful um, company as a business. And so I guess my question is, is how do you balance the need to be a successful business and obviously make a profit and and, and survive in the market um, and, uh, and also continue to, to kind of do this good and make that a, an absolute priority. So I guess this question really is about growth and how far do you see uh, the need to grow Patagonia as a business in order to um, actually continue to, to really do good? Well, I wanna stay being the mouse <laughs> in the <laughs> cat magazine. <laughs> I, I think, uh, <laughs> we're, we're not focused on profits. If you ask me how much we made last year, I have no idea. I couldn't care less. Or what, how, how much we're going to make this year. I, I'm a real Zen Buddhist about this whole thing. I know that the process of the business is going right. Therefore, the profits are going to happen. So we don't worry about being a profitable company. We don't worry about 
growth. We don't worry about all those things that a normal company worries about. Like for instance, we put in a childcare center, on-site childcare center, when there's only 50 in the whole United States, corporate childcare centers. Our accountants were saying, oh my God, this is gonna cost you a fortune. Uh, you know, it's gonna hurt the bottom line, blah, blah, blah. We don't care about things like that. We just knew that it was the right thing to do. And in fact, the best product that comes out of Patagonia is those kids out of childcare, hmm. including my own kids that came out of there. Those kids are brought up by the village. They're not brought up by a woman who was fired because she was pregnant and then has to raise a single child at home and she plugs them into the television all day long. Mm. These kids are brought up by the, the entire village and you can't believe the quality of the, those children. They, you go in there, I went in there one day and I said, hi hey, kids, how's school? One little kid said, we're not in school, we're at work. <laughs> <laughs> Our parents work over there, I work here. <laughs> <laughs> and they stick their hand out and shake hands with you instead of hiding behind their mother's skirt. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's incredible. And yet, if you listen to the accounts, they'll tell you, you can't do that. Doesn't work. <laughs> there was also, when we introduced daycare, and I, I was one of the ones opposed to this movie. Oh, I thought you were going to say you were in daycare. <laughs> no, I wasn't in daycare. Um, as, as, what happened actually happened is that it really did increase the lo employee loyalty. Right. Yeah. Um, it made people work harder for the company uh, and work smarter for the company, but it also really made a difference in the culture. It really makes a difference to have kids on site, and it reduces. I think I made a comment last night. It's very hard to act vice presidential around a toddler. Mm. Um, <laughs> And it increases the level of, of uh, kind of horizontal human, human concern that people have for each other rather than uh, uh, start to play act into the roles of hierarchy. The, the other thing I think is that we, it is very easy to be a kind of a corporation 1920 right. for us yeah. in terms of worrying about profit and um, sort of living within our means and, and walking away with a few more pennies at the end of the day that we then reinvest. It's not so hard to run our business that way. What would be impossible for us is if we were, I think, if we were trying to act like a Silicon Valley startup, if we were intended to sell the company very shortly and we were building, we were bulking it up for sale, uh, lowering quality, uh, uh, trying to drive down the cost, that would really spoil the company, and I don't think we could, I don't think we could operate within our values and do that. So the kind of traditional model of earn a profit every year, we're fine with that. But the the newer model of build up a company, make a killing, retire, and move to Rarotonga, we we can't do that. Well, thank you very much indeed, Vincent and Yvonne. Thank you for being here.